I'm Andy Horowitz. I teach American history and environmental studies here at Tulane, and it's my pleasure to welcome Kai Erickson to our campus. This is, as I hope you know by now, the third event in the series that the environmental studies program is hosting under the banner of the Katrina Disaster Now. And before I turn our attention to our distinguished guest, I'm going to take the opportunity to remind you about the two events that remain in our series. Uh, on Tuesday, November 10th, we're convening a discussion with leaders from across, across the Louisiana coast, places that are threatened right now by rising seas. And these uh, guests include Min Nguyen, the founder of the Vietnamese American Young Leaders of New Orleans, Reverend Tyrone Edwards, the pastor of the Zion Travelers Baptist Church in Phoenix, Louisiana, Rosina Philippe from the Atakapa Ishak Nation in Grand Bayou, and Teresa Dardar from Point Shan Indian Tribe. And through a partnership with WWNO, they're going to be joined uh, by NPR national correspondent Debbie Elliott for a conversation we're describing as covering rising seas, sinking land, climate change, Louisiana, justice, and community. And that's Tuesday, November 10th, 5.30 in Freeman Auditorium. And then our culminating event will take place a week after that, uh, November 17th at 5.30, also in Freeman. We've invited 15 Louisianans to reflect together on the phrase, the Katrina disaster now. And our speakers represent sort of compelling and provocative diversity of New Orleans. They range from the great clarinetist Dr. Michael White to the founder of levees.org, Sandy Rosenthal, the public housing activist Kawana Jasper, and a number of other uh, really compelling people. Now, for some of them, the phrase, the Katrina disaster now, will call to mind an acute crisis, an event that is now 10 years past. But for others, the Katrina disaster now is an invitation to reflect on how Katrina is an ongoing process, not just an event, but an ongoing process that continues to unfold into the present. Uh, I want to read you a couple of sentences that help to inspire our exploration of that blurred boundary between the acute and the chronic. Here it is. Uh, a chronicler of passing events may report that an episode itself lasted no more than an instant, a gunshot, say. But the traumatized mind holds on to that moment, preventing it from slipping back into its proper chronological place in the past, and relives it over and over again in the compulsive musings of the day and the seething dreams of night. The moment becomes a season. The event becomes a condition. I hope that at least one of you recognize that those words come from our distinguished guest, Kai Erickson. I'm going to string together two cliches. Uh, Professor Erickson needs no introduction because his reputation precedes him. If I were to start naming the awards and fellowships that you've earned, it would take up all of the time we have allotted for you to speak. Go ahead. No, well, we can go ahead. <laughs> but, for students here who may be encountering uh, him for the first time, let me say that Professor Erickson's the William Kennan Professor Emeritus of Sociology and American Studies at Yale University. He's the past president of the American Sociological Association and the Society for the Study of Social Problems. He's the author of Wayward Puritans, Studying the Sociology of Deviance. He's the author of Everything in Its Path, Destruction of Community in the Buffalo Creek Flood, and A New Species of Trouble, Exploration and Disaster, Trauma, and Community. And taken together, these books have reshaped the way scholars from across the humanities and the social sciences understand disaster, trauma, and community. Uh, over the past decade, Professor Erickson has turned his attention to our own disaster, to Katrina. He co-chaired the Social Science Research Council's Katrina Task Force. He's the editor of an extraordinary series of monographs being published by the University of Texas Press under the heading The Katrina Bookshelf, and we're lucky that several authors in that series are with us today. Uh, I'm proud to say that Kai was on my dissertation committee in graduate school. And from time to time, we would get together at Clark's Diner on Whitney Avenue in New Haven for lunch. And I would mention something that I had noticed in the course of my research about disasters in Louisiana. And inevitably, uh, Kai would offer a response that connected something that I had seen here with something he had seen many places. Or he might drive the implications of what I had noticed 10 miles down the road. Or often, he would just generously point out that I was absolutely wrong. <laughs> When I invited him to come visit us at Tulane, uh, Kai suggested that we try to recreate something of that atmosphere uh, of conversation at Clark's Dairy. So what we're going to do today is Kai is going to speak for around 20 minutes and offer a sort of opening salvo, <coughs> some remarks. And then I have some questions, some things that 
we were going to talk about together for a time, and then we're going to open it up to engage in sort of collective curiosity and wisdom here in the room. So please join me in welcoming Professor Kai Erickson. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Because I can, th this is a very strange system. I can hardly hear myself. <laughs> But that's not the point. I already know what I'm going to say. <laughs> but, um, I, I thought I wanted, I, I wanted to kind of emphasize what, what, what Andy just did, which is the original idea of this was it's to be a discussion. And it's, it was to be a discussion between the two of us and being the two of us and all of you. So everything I'm going to do now is meant as kind of a prologue. And what I'm going to do is kind of reflect on three different things about what happened at, at, about Katrina. And in order to, to fulfill my uh, obligation to be within 20 minutes. I'm going to almost have to read this and at least pay very close attention to my notes because he knows better than anybody. If I just start talking, we're all in big trouble. <laughs> so here we go. <clears throat> this is the, uh, the uh, this is our 10th year, as, as many of you will know. I'm, a, I'm in a problem here. When I can see this, I can't see you at the same time. <laughs> but it's uh, the, uh, the, uh, we're in the 10th year now, as many of you know, of discussing Katrina in one way or the other. And by now, we're just the the people people of us who are following are just floating on an endless sea of words that have been coming out of all kinds of people. And I've got a little package of words I want to bring out, but it is important that I I, I, I keep them within the, the time that I've set aside for it. So I'll just start off with with assertions, but they are meant to be prologues for for a later discussion. And one of them is that I think it's quite fair to 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 assert flatly that Katrina, in many ways, is far and away the most telling disaster of our national experience. And I'm thinking, thinking about the whole of it, in part because it tell us so, tells us so much with, of, about disasters, which is why a number of people here and the two of us up in front uh, spend so much time studying it ourselves. But even more so because it tells us so much about the social order that we're a part of. It, it takes us so much about the times that we live in and so much about ourselves. Uh, so, and the, uh, the three reflections that I'm going to have are not necessarily related, but the one, if there were titles to them, which they're not, one would be, what happened on the streets of New Orleans? And the second would be entitled, how do you locate Katrina in time? And the third would be, how do you locate Katrina in space? Uh, most of us, and that includes, I think, everybody here, except those who were directly looking at it with their own eyes, are drawing on fading memories when we try to recall what New Orleans was like in the days right after, immediately following the failure of the levees, which you'll all remember, you'll all know exactly when that was. But I think almost everybody who had that experience is going to remember that the first news broadcast that came out from, that, from this devastated city were almost unanimous in reporting that something truly depraved, something truly sinister was, was taking, truly really degenerate was taking place on the streets of New, of New Orleans. The police officers and vehicle and, and uh, rescue vehicles were being fired upon. Armed bands were ready to take over the business district and the homes of the already rich. Anarchy was loose on the land. I myself was kind of haunted by two different memories of kind of from a whole set of them that I was exposed to <coughs> as I was watching this from television from a distance away. And one of them was of homeowners in undamaged cities uh, of the city, sitting in rocking chairs on front porches with assault rifles across their knees and being, uh, being interviewed by reporters largely from out of town. And, be, the, and they, they being asked, what's going on here? And they saying, we're about to be attacked. And they say, well, how? And they say something like, under cover of darkness, which is an expression that uh, we, has to be listened to very, care, very carefully. Uh, and by whom? Well, you know them. Or uh, we were talking about this today, about, about a, a bridge that river, the, uh, the, when, when, uh, when gunfire erupted in a bridge that was reaching across a river from downtown New Orleans uh, on the part of people who were trying to prevent, uh, 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 who were trying to go, come across that, it, uh, leave the floodwaters and get to a much safer side. And one of the people who was asked, well, why, why was that a, a objection to their coming was, well, we just didn't want them. The New York Times 
described what was happening in New Orleans, and I'm going to quote now, and this is one reason we have to look so carefully, as a snake pit of anarchy, death, looting, raping, and marauding thugs, end quote. And the London Financial Times reported that in the conventional center, the convention center, which you'll remember is a, is a, was a place of refuge, quote, girls and boys were raped in the dark and had their throats, throats cut and bodies were stuffed in kitchens while looters and madmen exchanged fire with weapons they had looted, period, end of quote. And that period is the only punctuation in that whole sentence. And this is, this is in the financial London Times. Uh, the, uh, and the, uh, but what the, the main point of this is that what was going on was in the dark, you understand, that you couldn't see it. It was visible to the mind, but not necessarily to the eye. The CNN described the city as a, as a lawless, deadly war zone. And the two city officials who were most in a position to provide mature perspective on all that excitement were turned out to be part of the chorus themselves, which if you look back on it, it's not that hard a thing to understand. And one of them was in the mate was the mayor who appeared on an, an Oprah Winfrey show and declared that the people of New Orleans had reverted to quote an almost animalistic state end quote that people were witnesses to quote hooligans killing people and raping people end quote and the chief of police to whom reporters were turning regularly for reliable information as to what was going on out there added helpfully that that the Superdome which of course was another place of refuge had become a place where little babies were getting raped all the time, end quote. Well, I'm, uh, 10 years after the fact, here's the good news. Uh, the f very few of those reports are even close to uh, being accurate. There were no bullet holes in rescue vehicles. There were no bullet holes in police officers. We may never truly know what ghostly happenings took place out there under cover of darkness. Uh, but the, but, but the, almost all of the reports that we, they, in the New York Times and places like that on the, about the assaults and the homicides and the rapes, and even if it sometimes they did happen, uh, have to be understood as products of that surreal and macabre imagination that governed the mood of the city and actually governed the mood of the way the nation was reacting to what was happening here. There was a good deal of looting. There's no question about that. But an awful lot of it, quite obviously, had the, took the form of, of, of a kind of foraging for a kind of scavenging. One young man that I met when I first came down here said with a smile, uh, we was just living off the land, which seems to me is a very good way of describing what, was it, what, had, to be, what had to be done. There was a lot of real larceny, there's no question about that, but only a very small portion of that has been reported or, or imagined in the first place. Now, hard data is very hard to come by with the kind of thing I'm talking about right here, as you can well imagine. But here are two, two, two uh, examples that might, it could be very instructive about this. The Superdome, you'll remember that place of refuge, uh, was, uh, was a home for a while for more than 20,000 people. And that was that awesome location where, where, where babies were being raped and throats were being cut. And officials thought and said aloud that they thought that the, that the inside of the Superdome, when the time came to evacuate it, would be, like, it would be littered with bodies, uh, like, a bottle, like a battlefield. I'm quoting on that now. And they expected to find something like 200 bodies there, and they brought up several, uh, several refrigerator trucks for the purposes of taking them away. The actual roster turned out to be six bodies, and four of them have died of what the, own, the coroner called natural causes, and almost all of them were quite elderly so that they, were, they went into this, into this crisis very frail in the first place. One died of an overdose, presumably on his own behalf, on behalf, and one committed suicide. There was not a cutthroat in the house. And at the convention center, the same ex expectations prevailed, and the, same, and the same refrigerator trucks were brought up to the door, and the body count there was down to four, and three of them natural in the same sense that the, that the, that the, that the coroner was talking about elderly people. And one of them, uh, and, and then one of them, this is the fourth one, was a puncture wound. It was an actual homicide. Now, if you, if we, I don't know how you count homicide rates, but if you, if what you're at, what we have to be asked here, one person was the, was, was, was died of murder of three, th of 30,000 over four days, making up the most desperate people that have ever been gathered into two different places and from the count, they're coming from the hardest part of town. That may be the lowest homicide rate ever recorded in modern, in modern New Orleans. 
Now, the commanding officer of the first regular army units to enter the city saw what was happening at a glance, and his report was abrupt and to the point, and I'm going to quote him now. I have heard of situations in the Superdome and the Convention Center. I was at both of those locations. The reports are false. These things never happened, end quote, end of report. Yeah, so much for that. So these early reports were not only wrong, but they were exuberantly wrong. They were profoundly wrong. Uh, and what we should be asking ourselves, from whence did they come? How did such a thing can come, up, come about? From what chamber of the human heart do they come? From what sector of the social order? And why did those reporters and so many of us actually think this was going on out about them? These are, these are, what does it say about these reporters that are supposed to be so shrewd about the ways of the human animal? And what does it say, actually, about us to thinking that that was so? Well, it seems quite obvious now, so much so that one is tempted to say that it should go without saying that the pronoun them, uh, so, often, so, so often cited then, refers to African Americans. But it did go without saying in many of those reports, and it is extremely important that it not go without saying in national self-reflections now in the 10th anniversary of what really took place there. So it was pretty, this was bad news all around, uh, but there was a particular cost to be paid here too. A lot went wrong, as everybody here knows, about federal and state uh, efforts to, to, uh, to rescue people and to uh, bring about recovery and, 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 and that kind of thing. But down there in the fulcrum of things, we've just, they have to need to come to terms with the grim fact that that grotesque misreading of the landscape of New Orleans in that time had a cost, which was not just the way people felt about things. Because the, the, uh, it, it was a painfully long time before a heavily armed force that, that, that was supposed to come in to, to, uh, to rescue people prepared to take over. It took days for them to prepare to take over what they had been told was a city in insurrection, which was a, which was a, which was a rebellion. And on whose part was that rebellion to be? Well, uh, uh, on whose part? Well, you know that too. Uh, probably as likely as not, somebody called them. And in that long pause, people withered, people suffered, people died, they, people lost the hope and the illusion that they could, for the, over the long term at least, count on the goodwill of their government, their native land, and their fellow countrymen. Now, is that too dramatic a comment for somebody to make? It probably is. Uh, is, it, is it, did, are things ever that simple? No, they probably aren't. Am I speaking of just about everybody in the place? Certainly not. It might not even have been the majority. But it was there. No, so that's the end of point one. And point two begins by talking about historians and the rest of us, and it says so right here. Mm. <laughs> the, uh, but it also says historians and journalists and sociologists that we're going to be joining, the, joining that group. But when we sit down to tell a story of a disaster like Katrina, you were alluding to this a minute ago, they were very likely to treat it as if it was an event bounded in time and in space. We frame disasters in much the same way that we do wars. There's a day in which it begins, and there's a day at which it ends. They are in an interruption of, uh, of normalcy, and they belong to a particular place, and they, belong to a, and they belong to a particular span of time. And we often mark the distance between the, the now and the then, whatever that turns out to be, by observing anniversaries, showing how, dis, how long the distance is between the thing that was and the thing that now is, or other, other occasions of looking back, which an awful lot of these, these, this ocean of words that I've been talking about has its, its character. Uh, but but I think it's I think it's a, a very strong case that can be made, and I know that you agree uh, that the setting a disaster in that kind of a framework can be a very serious obstacle to understanding what it is in the first place. So what I'm going to do with if, with my next two points, which are going to be uh, mercifully great, uh, more brief than the ones I just gave you, is to talk about looking at Katrina in time and looking at Katrina in space. And I'll begin the first by just saying. You know, when is it reasonable to say that Katrina or any disaster has come to an end? You know, when the book is closed, when the story has been concluded. And historians again, but against, I'm also, it says right here, the rest of us, take, uh, take a lot of comfort, not so much in being able to declare specific times when it begins and it ends, but when you can begin to talk about it in the past tense, because the past tense is how you tell a story. The past tense is how you, how you relate a narrative. 
And that, that way of thinking can affect official accounts too, just to give you an example, uh, different counts too. And I'm going to give you an example. If we ask uh, 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 somewhere, what would the official death toll of Katrina is? We're going to come up with a number, something like this. The last time I saw it was 1,673. And don't write that down. I don't think it's the same thing now, but it is the number as exact as that. And, what, and, the, and the total, that's the total number of those people who are thought to have been crushed, who have been drowned, to have been swept away, to have been killed in some way by the storm itself or by the floodwaters that followed. And for months afterwards, well, I was a witness to this once, as I think a couple of other people here, a, a, a body would be discovered here and there under a pile of wreckage, curled into a dark corner somewhere, and the death rate would go up by one. It was almost as if a bell rang on the the church on the green. But the, the point I want to make here, and I think you can feel this coming a quarter of a mile away, this has got to be one of the most totally meaningless form of arithmetic that you can possibly attach to something like Katrina. The official toll, death toll of Katrina does, does, does not include persons who are almost sure to have died uh, as, uh, as a result of what, of what the disaster did to them. Suicides, for example, that took place after the fact are not counted as part of the, uh, part of the, the, the death rate for, for, uh, for Katrina. And why? Because it happened afterward, because it happened later. And I've met any number of people, and I think there are lots of people out in this room have, who, too, and maybe even know themselves, who know of others who simply slumped over and died as a result of Katrina. They were victims of misery and of neglect and sheer weariness, people who had lost the support of sustaining communal circles, just not sure how to keep, to how to keep going in their, in their absence, people who drank themselves to death, people who veered off the edge of dark roads, taking chances they never would have taken under other circumstances, and probably most prominent of all, people who stopped taking what they knew to be self-sustaining self medications because they just didn't care anymore. Uh, and if, if, if it's hard, and what, and what I'm trying to do here about counting, that just imagine how difficult it must be to count the wounded, not just the wounded in body, but the people who were traumatized in one way or another, in their hearts, in their minds, in their spirits, by what happened during, during, that, during that time. Uh, we call that, so what these things I'm talking about are called the aftermath. Uh, but it's not an aftermath. It's right, you know, if, if, if you go right down there on ground level where people live out their lives, uh, and this, this is the story. This is the history. Uh, you, you'd have to see how I wrote that here. The history <laughs> for vast numbers of persons, no matter what, sen what tense they're speaking of when they're talking about it, no matter what tense they're even thinking about, when there, it's an ongoing event, which is exactly the expressions. I've always wanted to wondered what the word aftermath meant. So now I'm going to say, it's not the aftermath, it's the math. And if anybody can tell me what that means, I'd be very curious to know, because <laughs> I've, I've always thought that. If, uh, yeah. So so much for endings. Now for beginnings. I'm going to be very brief on this, and I will be coming back to this, because I am sitting next to somebody more expert in this than me. But I do open, I want to open with a story. That I was once, I once served as a speaker at an annual meeting of a Red Cross, the Red Cross a, a manual meeting of some kind, I'm not sure. Uh, we had, had an audience of just acres of people. You couldn't even see the back, the back of the room. And I, the person I was sharing the platform with was a guy named Robert Cates, who was a remarkable speaker and a remarkable scholar, and there are people here who know him. And he's just the kind of person you don't want to speak just before you under any occasion <laughs> that you can possibly avoid. But he told the following story and described it as the only joke uh, that he had ever heard about a disaster, and it goes like this: the, uh, two men are walking, two elderly men are walking down a beach in Florida somewhere. They haven't met each other before, and one of them begins to talk a little bit about himself. And he says, "Well, you know, I once had a little manufacturing firm, and it did very well for two or three decades. And uh, but after, you know, there was a, there, towards the end, it, it didn't do, it wasn't doing as well as it was before, uh, but." The, uh, but uh, would you believe this? A, fly, a fire came along and just and just empty thing. But luckily, I had a lot of insurance, so I'm allowed to live out here on the on the beaches in great comfort. And the other one says, "Well, you know what? My story is almost exactly like that. I had a manufacturing firm, and it was doing very well for quite some period of time. I think I actually gained, you know, saved some money. But you know, towards the end, it the, thing, the same thing happened to you. People didn't weren't buying the product so much. 
But you know what happened? A flood came along, it just washed me out. But luckily I had some insurance so I could afford to live in Florida, just like you do. And they keep walking along for a while, and then the first man says to the second, uh, do you mind, can I ask you a personal question? How do you start a flood? <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason I tell the story is, that it's, uh, it's not as funny as it used to be because we do know how to start a flood. <laughs> and, uh, you, and you can, going back over in the history, if you want to talk about this particular flood and you want to go back over, to over history and in time, we're going to find that uh, uh, engineers have done the beautiful job of creating a flood. Uh, you know, with, with, if, you, if you look back in the way I'm, I'm thinking about in the history of, uh, and in fact, if you really want, if, if, you, if I were asked the question, I think if any, anybody who knows something about it would, now, when did Katrina actually begin? And it might be the day or the, or the, when two or three, the first settlers that came here, looked out over the, over, over the landscape and said to themselves, I'm smart enough and skilled enough to change the designs of nature and because I see a profit in it. And you could almost, but we'll, we'll be coming back to that, which is why I'm going to move very quickly to my, to what is, what is my last point, which is locating Katrina in space. And here I'm going to be a little. I'm going to be a little divisive here. I mean, those, uh, crafty. So at the risk as though I'm engaged in a, in, a stra in, a, in a strange sleight of hand, I'm going to note that there are two entities, entities that can reasonably be called New Orleans. And the first and the most obvious of them, and the only one we hear anything about in the news, is that parcel of land marked off by boundary lines and represented on maps. And we're in the center of that space, sitting right here now. And virtually every word we've heard from officials trying to, involved in trying to, re, to restore the damage done by the Katrina uh, is damaged both, uh, bam, damage both the property and to people, issues from that New Orleans and, have, and refers to that New Orleans. Uh, another way to envision a city, however, and it's one which social scientists have, have been flirting with for a long time, there are other sociologists here with little smiles, at least slightly, at that one, is, that, uh, that, is to liken a city to an organism. And to say something like, that the cells of that organism are the people who constitute it, the rhythms of that organism are the way those cells interact with one another, <coughs> the culture of that organism is the patterning of everyday life among the persons who occupy that space. And if we can think like that for just a moment, uh, we'll find it easier to imagine that these cells really are New Orleans in a certain sense. There are the fibers that give it substance, gave it substance, past tense there, uh, gave it character, gave it form, and that those cells continue to be New Orleans even when harsh winds have driven those cells a long way away, which has happened, which, which happens, as you well know, to tens of thousands of people. And it makes a very profound difference when we, when we, when we hear about the restoration of, of New Orleans or the rebuilding of, of, of New Orleans or the reconstitution of New Orleans or things like that. Uh, it makes a big difference whether what we're referring to are those acres of land that are seen on the, that on the city map that are called the lower, the lower Ninth Ward, for example, or to those thousands of people who were the Lower Ninth in the sense that they occupied in before 2005 in the sense that they occupied it, in the sense that they built it, in the sense that they belonged to it, and the sense that they constituted it, its history from the beginning. <coughs> uh, and that, that truly matters, I'm going to suggest, as I bring this to a close in the first instance, because people who have been driven off into distant and often alien places, I think there are many people here who know people of whom that's true, see themselves as a part of the living tissue of what is and what was and will always be to them their New Orleans, which is their home. And it matters a lot in the second instance because so few voices from that other New Orleans, from that other Lower Ninth, I'll use that example too, are being heard now in councils deciding what will happen to the city of New Orleans. Now my understanding is, uh, the numbers you don't, don't have to be correct to, be, to, to give you the scale of it anyway, that $71 billion have been spent to the city of New Orleans, which is to say that first de definition of what New Orleans is and a very, very small number in comparison set aside to restore that other New Orleans, which is the cells that once made it up. And it will probably come as very little surprise to you because my, I, 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 you can see where I'm going from long ago, but that, that the people who, who are left out of that definition, this modern definition of what New Orleans are, are for the most part black and for the most part poor 
and by a very wide margin, the most likely to have been severely damaged by the ravages of Katrina itself. Well, that is a device. We're going to call this a perspective as we begin, begin a larger conversation. And it is a trick, too. But it can offer a perspective. And I'm just going to end by saying that, that the, the, uh, the, uh, if, if it's one thing to say that a problem needing repair is a location in geographic space, and quite another thing to say that a problem needing repair is a scattered mass of people who were once clustered in that space. And when you think about that, we have to, re have to think again of what does the word restoration mean and what does the word of, of recovery mean. And that's how I end. This is not the ending of a talk, it's the beginning of a conversation. <laughs>
would, uh, resulted in, this, in, this, in, the, in the settlement was that a considerable sum of money, I, I can't remember, I'll say 150000 or something like that, would be given to everybody who, everybody who lived on Buffalo Creek, who suffered the fact that, they, that their community had been damaged. And that included people who weren't even there at all on the day of the, there was a different definition of what was trauma, really. That the trauma was the loss of communality as well as the, as the, as the effects of the, of the. Well, so that got me, uh, if, you've, if you've done, then I went back and I did it a second time, and I won't even talk about that. But once you get, get into the category of people who are seen as experts in this, in this way, then you get invited to lots of other places. And so, uh, and so I, I, I can't possibly remember well enough to go through it, but over the fullness of time. Uh, uh, I, I, it wasn't long after that that I went to the Three Mile Island, the nuclear accident, which took place. This, is, won't, this won't be good, the right chronology, it doesn't matter. And I uh, spent some time there. And then I spent some time in Northwest Ontario with a band of Ojibwe Indians who had, had a suffered, suffered a toxic emergency of one kind or another all of which showed so much something about what the colonialism that they experienced before. And then I went to, to Amakali in Florida where Haitian migrant, migrant workers were being, were, you know, being thrashed about and, and, treated, and treated badly. And uh, the, a very sociological and anthropological kind of, it, it's, it's very hard to figure out some way to talk about that in, in, in courts of law where the language is very, very different than the disciplines that most of us come from. And then that took, that took me overseas a couple of times. So I, was, I went to Northumberland where there had been a hoof and mouth disease. And I spent a fair amount of time on a small, on a, an atoll out in, the, out in Micronesia that had suffered a nuclear a radiation from an atomic test in Bikini, which was about 250 miles away. And this was a little atoll where there was no, where nobody spoke English, where no, and there, nobody, there was no electricity of any kind at all. But the, the assumptions that they made about what had happened to them, living all by themselves and only having only contact with Americans who told them things that were, most Americans didn't know what happened either. So I'm not talking about lying so much, but the learning from American doctors what had happened to them is like, I mean, anyone here knew what they, what they knew at that point about what, what radiation did. Uh, uh, and then the uh, and I've, I'm probably missing out one or two, but but the uh, most lately and for and for a longest period of time in U Yugoslavia, where war broke out in ways that that uh, I would I'm going to call this the sociologic of it or the anthropologic of it, where, where the, the, uh, to look at it through a sociological lens really tells you things about what happened, which which a political analysis doesn't quite. Is that what you want? It'll do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we work, and uh, and you know, in the next forty years, I expect to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were talking last night how different the geography of your life work might have looked if you had taken up the study of leisure instead. <laughs> sort of. <all. laughs> uh, but having seen all of those communities in those moments of stress, and your work has emphasized really what those places have in common. I wonder what, if there's anything about Katrina that surprised you or that oh, distinguished itself. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm going to say only 10 years have gone by, so I'm, I'm still thinking, I'm still, <laughs> but it's a very good question, which is, uh, which is what you always say when you're not sure how to answer it, <laughs> but it really is. <laughs> the, the, um, the, 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 the ironies of this are, that some of the people, I'm, I'm looking at a couple who, who belong in the same category that I am, but they, they are drawn, were drawn into Katrina in the first place because they had experience of disasters elsewhere. And so the assumption was made that what we learned in these other places would be very useful in talking about this. <coughs> this turned out, the, <coughs> with one even remote exception, this turned out to be quite different for me in that a very large proportion of what we have to attract credit to Katrina for having done had to do with the national response to what to it, where a lot of these other disasters were kind of this, they're smaller, more contained. You know, they, there was a national re response to Three Mile Island and things like that. But basically, most of you have never heard of Grassy Narrows, and most of you have never heard of Immokalee, and it, 
you know, so the, the, the issue itself had to do with what the disaster did to the people who were exactly there and caught up in it and, 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 uh, and damaged by it. So what we're talking about now is that at least half of what I'm talking about now is not just what happened to the people who were here, uh, but what happened, what, what, what it did to the, the entire climate, partly the climate here, which is what I began talking about, but the climate that became part of, the, part of national reflection on what this thing was. Uh, but I would say there are a lot of, of similarities here, and I would say the ones that, struck, that strike me the most is that uh, if I look back at the places that I, 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 we didn't have a chance to talk about what was in them, but one of the things that I came up with in most of those, in, in a, har a large number of those disasters, if not all of them, was that if, when disaster strikes people who are, the disasters, I'm gonna go back a step, put it a different way, is that disasters have a really remarkable way of striking people who are the, least, are the least likely to be able to cope with it. And it's got something to do with the way human beings spread themselves over the surface of the earth. It takes something to do with where we allow people. If, a, you know, Cancer Alley is a place where we don't, we, we, there are very few people we are permitted to live there. I mean, if we're talking about social mores and things like that. But the, the, uh, I think what happened to, uh, to the people of Katrina, it depended a great deal on kind of what, what I've other places called the, the, the acute, the, this is an acute disaster that is in itself, but there are kind of chronic disasters that people go through that have a lot to do with the, living in the wrong place, long to do with not having enough income, long, uh, long to do with being in the, with the wrong race, you know, and the, <coughs> so the combination of, of, of Katrina striking Combined with the with the disasters that with, with the with the with the kind of the traumas that preceded them was one, but that was also true of what followed, because that the what happened to the people that's the, that's why I ended up talking about the people who are now gone and are not going to come back and who, and who at least officially we've lost a track of a lot of them, but they're suffering a, they, from what we little we do know there are traumatic effects of what was happening to them as they they see they are many of them see themselves actually in a kind of exile which is painful a human experience as it can be. So to me, it's, 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 I mean, that may be one reason why a historian would, would develop, have a new interest in the kinds of things that, 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 that sociologists have been talking about for a long time. Because it's what happened before, and then there's the event, and what happened after are all ought to be gathered together in this ongoing event that you were mentioning. I don't know if, I, I, I don't know if that came out the way I meant it, but. Um, Let's um, yeah. Oh. Wait, did something happen? That was oh. I thought oh, that, was, I, that was an approval. Yeah, you got yeah, you got a thumbs up. <laughs> but only one out of a sample size. <laughs> so this is maybe not. I don't know. We'll, <laughs> we'll try again. Okay. Uh, thinking particularly about the response, and you focused in your comments on, I think your phrase was the anarchy loose on the land, that many believe to be the case, yeah. but. You so I think your phrase was exuberantly wrong, and yet the response to it was real and did real damage. Yes. Um, you know what? Our propensity to believe those rumors gave us Thomas Hobbes. It gave us the war of all against all. And yet, I want to ask you about the sociologists who, for a century, have been telling us that is not what would happen at all. And in fact, we would have the city of comrades. That, that when the disasters, communities under stress come together, we join together and we have who Charles Fritz in his famous essay from oh, the yeah, 60s yeah, says yeah, we, yeah, yeah. I think that he was trying to make us all feel better about the perils of nuclear war, but he said, you know, under disaster we have therapeutic communities and then Rebecca Solnit just recently, yeah. a very good writer in 2007 or eight, I guess, wrote, um, her book is called A Paradise Built in Hell, yeah. the extraordinary yeah. communities that arise in disaster. So I wanna know, there's this pretty well-developed literature that would tell us not at all to expect what we saw. So I'm curious, do you think that they are looking at different data? Are they reading the same scene differently? Why is it that you see a corrosive community where others see therapeutic communities? Well, I don't, I mean, actually I don't see it. Okay. If, if, if New Orleans is the, is the community, I see a corrosive community. But uh, Hobbes really was not talking about communities at all. You know, he, what he was really saying is that, that when you come right down to it, at, in the fulcrum of things, that's my second time I've used that, <laughs> we're, all, we're all for, our own, for ourselves and our own interests. And the, but I think, I think the, the, 
there are heroic acts that some of which I don't even like took place in Katrina of people showing their fellowship with other people, but of a kind. And so that, so it would, it, it, and I think the great, the, that bridge I'm talking about was the Gretna Bridge and people here would know what that is. The shock of going across that bridge to your fellow kind and being, meant that the line between kind had been drawn, had been, it's not, hadn't been drawn as much to a decisive a way of thinking, but it had been expressed in a way was that, that, that was shocking to me, shocking to everybody else, and, and probably, I'm hoping, at least a little bit shocking to the people who were carrying the guns on the other, the other end of the bridge. But, the, but still, it, this was not, the, the, the community of the people that went across took very good care of each other. And from what we learned about the convention center, the, the, we, we learned about the anarchy taking place in it, but nobody, those people couldn't possibly have survived if there hadn't been an awful lot of, I don't, I've never met anybody who was there, and maybe there are people who have been, who had, but there's no other explanation that, that survival really required upon people taking at least a little bit of care or some kind of attention and not taking that much of what, what happened to other people. And that certainly happened in all of the, the rearrange, the, you know, in the, in the communities as they came, as they, as they came back together. So uh, my biggest thing here is not so much that people fell into fragments of themselves, but that they fell into fragments of a kind that I'm not sure this society can, the particular fragment that I don't think this society can afford, which is a matter of personal you know, that conviction. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> right, I've got, yeah, got now five, gonna, five out of 150. <laughs> yeah. Witnessing that scene, if, you're, if you were one of the people who was trying to walk across that bridge and getting shot at, or sitting in the place of refuge waiting for help that didn't come, yeah. um, your writing and your remarks today I, would, would lead us to understand the sort of trauma that one might feel as being, uh, gaining the sense that human institutions can't be trusted. The revealing the world to be an unsafe place and that that is a sense that one would carry forward for a long time. And do I have that right so far? Uh, up until Katrina, yeah, yeah. So, so what, what, what I want what I want to ask is that, I, uh, oh, 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 all right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, you, yeah, I have that yeah. right so far. Yeah, so, what, what, what I want to ask is that, um, and I know there are psychologists in the audience, so maybe they'll tell me I've got this wrong. But I, my understanding is that psychologists look at trauma or PTSD as a sort of impairing pathology, that it limits your one's ability to move through the world with success, and yet, by my way of seeing it, the people that we would describe as traumatized have simply learned the truth and that what they knew before was just a convenient fiction. And so there's some tension, I guess, between sort of horror of living in perpetual fear from having your eyes open and living in a sort of ignorant state of unwarranted calm yeah. of some kind. I wonder if you have anything to say about that. Well, the, 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 the times that I can recall writing about losing confidence in, in nature is where I was making a distinction between a, 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 uh, what we used to call natural disasters. A storm comes along and knocks your house in, the, it, gets, it gets restored, and you know, no, you know more about nature than you did before. But when it's a disaster that involves radioactivity or toxicity or something, something that is a danger that goes far deeper than, or, or when, you, when you think that what caused the disaster was other people not taking care of you, which for example would, be, would have been one of the things that was, Almost everybody on Buffalo Creek thought that the coal company did not take the precautions that they should have. So then you begin to get a feeling it's not just that the piston company is not worth it, but maybe you can't count on companies, or maybe you can't count on the weather. We live in, a, in, in an atmosphere of thought now where not being able to count on the weather, on the weather. But I mean, but but in much earlier times, that that to, to not be the, the when things like that happen, uh, the. It isn't just the agency that felt the fall to you, but the idea of agencies, and it isn't just you know the winds that got you, but the idea of nature, and uh, and I think that's I think that's pretty been pretty well established in, in in what I won't even say what psychologists call trauma, but I think what I think 
sociologists often use the word in a somewhat different context because we're talking about the, uh, we, we can't see what goes on inside the mind. We can only see how it works in, 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 uh, you know, in, in the way people gather together afterwards. And that, that uh, I, I can't tell you how many people I think I've met who just no longer feel that they can count on their government, no longer they can, they can, they can, it's a, they can count on their family, they can count on their, their, their community, but they can't count on, on, on the, the forces that they thought that, uh, you know, it's not just that they aren't beneficent, but that they sometimes they, there's a very strong feeling that they're out to get me or my kind. And they may be right. I mean, this, no, is, yeah, this, is, yeah. this is my, I guess, and, and I think in some ways climate change, as you allude to, uh, clarifies this in some ways because we now have the sense that well because somehow because of all the oil we're burning the world is warming so the oceans are warmer which means the hurricane is bigger so every time the wind blows we know that there's culpability somewhere yeah. maybe we own a piece of it but it's diffuse and real I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story that goes back to that first disaster this is now 40 years ago 40 plus years ago a, a woman who lived up in the upper valley, upper of the valley. Uh, I used to go see from time to time. A very, uh, 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 and she was the only person I knew in, in all of West Virginia that read the New York Times. And she read the New York Times for the following reason. And she would, that when I would come to visit her, she would take the day's time and she would say, let me show you what this world is really like. And she would say, on page one, a locomotive came off the whales. On page three, a, to a toxic, a, there was a toxic leak in, in, in Bangladesh. On sp page six, this building fell in. On, well, that's all she saw. So that, that, that uh, her, her vision of the world did not include what was in these other stories too because her, her gaze had been fixed on this thing that had happened to her. Now what you say, everything that was in the paper that she had, re had recorded in her mind actually did happen. There was, no, there was not an error in it, any of it. But if that's all you see, just imagine, I don't, I'm not gonna, I, I, won't, I wouldn't welcome this on anybody, but if all you can see is that, how hard is it to sleep at night? How hard is it to do anything else? So that's the kind I'm talking about. I'm doing it much more dramatically than is required for the purpose. But, but, uh, but to come to feel that these forces that you at least can ignore most of the time, even if you don't think they're always, always beneficial, but they certainly don't mean you harm. The United States government doesn't mean you harm. Uh, but how many people would would you th would you think now on the, in the surface of the of the United States have have reasonable reasons to think that that's not true? Um, I, I, you know, I don't think it's true, but I can, but I find it easier to understand why others might. Yeah. That's all I really that's all I really meant by that. That's all. Yeah, it has to be understood. That this is the this is historians and sociologists and every one of you are, are just are exactly the same. That to get an idea across, you make it sharper than your mind has even made it in your own mind. You know, it's <laughs> it's uh, so it, it, half the things that you say as declarative sentence really are questions. <laughs> well, here's what don't, yeah. don't you think that's true? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask uh, one more question and then turn it over to you. So there's plenty of time for a bigger conversation, but I'm. Uh, I think I'm required to use the word resilience in our conversation today. People are laughing because this has become, this is not just, that is uh, the president calling to say, yeah, yeah to say, see, I, that was, that's exactly, that was the buzz for saying resilient. The bell goes off in New Orleans when you say the word resilient. That's exactly right. I meant to do that, I'm that's sorry. That's right. Uh, the official events that the city of New Orleans put on for the 10th anniversary were gathered under the sign of Katrina 10, uh, resilient New Orleans. Yeah. And I think you're really not allowed to say the word disaster in New Orleans anymore without saying disaster resilience. And in part that's because federal funding agencies, if you want grant money to do your research, that is, that is what they want to fund. They want to look at the thing itself, they want to ask about resilience. So I just wonder if you think that's a useful concept or how you make sense of that word. I don't think it's a word you use often in your own work. Yeah, I, I find it a very difficult word and very difficult idea. And I, it, it has more to do with the, the sentences that people use it in than the, than the meaning of the word itself. And I think probably what I would say is that, that uh, 
uh, resilience is built in, is wired into the human nature. And I don't think, I don't think that, that, that our ancestry would last at a decade if, it had, if that hadn't been so. So the, the, the notion that people can recover and the notion that they can make something out of it and they can survive and they, uh, uh, the, that shouldn't be, that oven by itself should not be surprising. Uh, and so it's almost as if you begin the other way around because what we're, when we're saying that resilience has come to X, we're saying that something has been gone for a long time is now coming back. And so the, the, what we're now talking about, if, if, if you're saying if, if this is suddenly a very resilient city, it meant there must have been times when it would, but why, why would, does that surprise you? Wasn't that true in 1890? Wasn't that true in 1840? So I, I don't want to be too, 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 you know, too crafty about this. But, but uh, the, the story of the disasters is not, ju it's not, the, it's not uh, it's less about the resilience, I would say, but what happened in the years when the resilience was insufficient. And that's what we're talking about when we mean trauma. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about disgust and what we're talking about when people who, 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 are, who are kind of left out. Uh, but I'm, I'm as proud as anybody could be if, you, if we hear that, that downtown New Orleans is, you know, is uh, but I won't forget, and this is why I ended where I did, that there are 50,000 people for whom downtown was their downtown and they're not here at all. And, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 they're, not suffer they're not profiting from that resilience in any way that I can see right on the surface, you know. We don't even know where they are. That's a, I, I don't want to end on such a sad note as that. No, we're not, but someone's going to deliver a silver lining okay, with questions, yeah. but I think there's a, there's a microphone so we can uh, hear each other. I think we may have a designated West should be on, right? Uh, I, you read the article by Malcolm Gladwell, New yeah. Yorker. Yeah. He seems to be pretty strongly at variance with what you're saying, and I'm wondering what your, your take on it is. That, you know, that, 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 there, that the fact that 50,000 people didn't come back, that they positive good, that their lives have been better, yeah. uh, their life chances have for themselves and their children yeah. are far superior. And I'm just curious to, to, to know what you, what's your take on that article. I, I was very uh, dismayed by it, the, myself, and, and I had the, uh, I, think by, I think the main reasons are, first of all, the data that he is talking about was not about Katrina at all. And what he, what he really is talking about, the, the studies done, that when people go from, a, from a, a, a place that is not very nourishing to a place that is more nourishing, they, they do better. And that's, that's well known, you know, it, by, among people who know that. But that doesn't mean that these people, uh, and, I've, and then I was very struck by, if you remember what his beginning data was? People who were incarcerated. And he began by saying, well, there has been a study done, and you can learn a lot from this, because there were X number of, of people who were in prison at the time of Katrina, in prison, in, in, in jails, in, in uh, in, in, uh, in, New in New Orleans. And uh, some of those have, have gotten out in the meantime. And those who went to other cities are less likely to have, 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 uh, have been, uh, what's, what's the word for it? Re Caught again, you know. The, uh, the, uh, there's a word for it which I'm blocking, which I'm blocking out. Recidivists. Recidivists, yeah. Uh, but if, I mean, the first, what would occur to me is that if you were to get, try to draw a sample of the people who were in Katrina in 2005 that had the least responsibilities for what was going on, that had the fewest people to take care of, who had the, who had the, 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 most the most unlikely to have an interest in what was happening in the property, it would people that were currently in prison. So to think of them as a sample of anything struck me as something he shouldn't have done. And I, I, I don't know whether he had a chance. He's a very good reporter from, from everything I've seen before. So uh, my, my first reaction to it was, was uh, it, um, this is a, almost maybe a little unfair, but there, there were a lot of things that were read on the 10th anniversary of people who felt they ought to say something about Katrina, whether or not they had been studying it for a long period of time. And he had, he had caught this and he had found this thing. And there was nothing, there was a, there was a logic to what he said. It wasn't stupid. 
it was just kind of a, kind of a very odd, a, an odd collection of facts for, for the particular story that he was wanting to, you know, why would he have these events in that story? I couldn't tell, do you, are you dotting in agreement? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 <laughs> I yeah. Pretty, I was pretty upset. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the, uh, and, and part of it, it was the, um, I think all people, I mean, there are a lot of people here who I, who I know who would, you know, if this is 10 years of study on this thing, and the, the effort that a number of people went through to kind of say, well, now it really is over, which is a 10th anniversary, part of what a 10th anniversary is. And this may have been his effort to join that, that course. I don't know. I would really like to find out what he thinks about it now. Because what I know of him, I don't know him personally, but he's, he's a reflective, thoughtful reporter, it seems to me. Shocked. Yeah, shocked? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to tell him what you said, <laughs> <laughs> if I ever do. I've heard both use the term anniversary yeah. to talk about uh, Katrina. The first, second, and third years after the disaster, people were not using that term. Yeah, this is right. Yeah. So I wonder yeah. if you guys can talk a little bit about the politics of the change from commemoration to anniversary. So there's a long history of historians and sociologists who study collective memory, the politics of commemoration, yeah. and anniversaries. So when I think of anniversary, I think of something happy that you celebrate. When I think of a commemoration, that's something that, that that's, inspires reverence and awe and respect um, and a sense of sadness and almost remorse. And I've been somewhat concerned about the, the shift in rhetoric yeah. and discourse over the, over the years here. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if you guys can talk a little bit about not so much um, what those terms mean, but what they symbolize from what's happening on the ground level here, but also, I think, what's happening at the, the uh, government level, at the state, as well as the federal level, too. I'll just take one, two. Well, I, no. you first. I'm just going to, mine is going to be a very brief remark, which, is, I mean, which doesn't matter for his talk, maybe. I'll, but he, <laughs> but the, uh, the, the word anniversary has been used. And the reason I know that is because of the position that I've been in, that I, over, over the time I've been asked to write a first, year, a first anniversary piece and a second anniversary piece. But I think you're exactly right. The context was really, let's never forget. You know, the, the anniversary in this case only meant that one year has now passed. And I had this feeling this time, the 10th anniversary, is, I, I, think it's, I think we're saying the same thing. That now it's now we're not we're celebrating the recovery first of all, but at the same time uh, uh, we are now marking the distance between us now and what happened then. So I think the maybe it's what the word anniversary has come to mean. So I don't know I, the, the the places that I wrote about it were were in northern newspapers for the most part. So I don't know quite. So maybe you should be well, in I, fact I, you should, you know about here. What is the use of it here? I think. I would just add, um, I think your critique is an important one. Where I focus my attention is, is actually less on the word anniversary than on the 10 years. 10 years since what? Uh, you know, I th we might now be 10 years since water was drained from the whole city, but we're not 10 years since the decision to knock down 5,000 units of public housing. We're not 10 years since the decision to lay off a bunch of Public school teachers thought they had the protection of contract. We're not tenu there's So there's all of the, so I think that the work, not just the work of the idea of an anniversary, that we're 10 years since some date certain when a catastrophe occurred that then we move ever farther from can serve to distort our view of Katrina as a process that took place over time and was not an acute rupture. It was not just the levy breach. It was the series of decisions before and after that gave it meaning. It's really, this is, uh, 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 maybe the mistake we made right at the beginning was to call it Katrina. Uh, Katrina actually was a hurricane that that uh, that had left. It was no longer on the meteorological charts by the time the levees broke in New and, 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 You know, to call it Katrina is just a. That's almost by itself to date it, isn't it? Anyway. 
Yeah, do you, do you have it, thoughts on this? It, it, he does. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm thinking about the term of the first couple of years, I never heard the word anniversary drop. There were very solemn, yeah, funeral-like yeah. uh, yeah. rituals and ceremonies going yeah. on. That's yeah. the way it was. But in the last couple of years, there's not the, the sense of funeral-like cer ceremonies anymore. They're not rituals of mourning. Yeah. They're rituals of celebration and happiness. Yeah. I agree. I, I, that's something that I found that's very real. profound. Yeah. And I think, and I think, that's the spirit Gladwell. I think was caught up in a bit. Yeah. Uh, we used to recall uh, Katrina, the federal flood of two thousand five. Uh, yeah. <laughs> more, more realistically captured really what went on, or as we understood yeah. some of the roots of the disaster. Yeah. And the anniversary that we're celebrating now seems really a booster's anniversary. Yeah, okay. Is, okay. And, you know, there yeah. should be self congratulation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But a lot of people are in voluntary exiles, and I don't know if they'll ever come back. Yeah. <clears throat> There's a question in the back. Yeah. Question in the back. Oh, oh, wherever you. Well, mine's just an extension okay, sure, of this. Sure. Be um, Kai, your um, joke telling colleague, Gates. Yeah, he, I, I was looking at you. Yeah. Four phases of uh, disaster response. Craig Holtman and I were honored to have him approach us to do some work on it. And the fourth phase was memorialization. And I think in, in the context of this, it just never happened. Yeah. The small number of memorials around the city, and it goes with your comment about you know yeah. the, so, the solemnity of the process. If Case were still working, and I thought to be in touch with him, as you know, he's quite senior. Was to say, where is it? You know, yeah. we didn't have yeah. it. Yeah. Well, th that though, my way of reading the relatively sp sparse physical memorialization that's happened is to say that most, for many people, Katrina's not over, and because it's not dead, we we don't memorialize it yet. And I think that that may be, despite the best efforts to call it an anniversary and push it into the past, that lack of a physical marker may be in part our resistance to calling it done. <laughs> so, I, I can try to project. I'm really glad that memorialization was brought up because that's what I'm really interested in. And I um, took a class with Meredith Fike and I went out and I interviewed some people about Katrina and the memorials. And you're right, there are not that many. And people also don't really care about them or know about them. But the thing that I found really, really interesting is that everyone that I talked to created something. They all created something in their own way. A couple of people wrote books, a couple of people um, made movies. They all did their own individual type of personalizing, of uh, memorialization. Um, and the thing that I thought was the most interesting was this one gentleman that I talked to mentioned that he, his, his family all lived within a couple of blocks of each other in Chalmette, and they all lost everything, everything. And he didn't lose anything, and he couldn't let his family's possessions just go away. So he took from each of their homes, he took a couple of pieces, and he refurbished them and gave them to them in, you know, whenever the time was right. So he actually took me on a tour of his house, and in every room he had something. He had half of a baby grand piano. He had the bottle of gin that fell out of somebody's you know, shopping cart when he decided it was time for him to leave. He had all of this stuff that was somehow important. So I just thought that that was really interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even though people don't are really into the big you know, memorials that we typically think of post-disaster, People have done individual things, creative things. Very good, very good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you had mentioned that, um, that even at countless people who express serious doubts that they can um, trust and depend on the government. And given your experiences in other countries, have you found a similar trend in those places? Or would you say this is a phenomenon hmm. exclusively found in the US that's exacerbated by our history and present of institutionalized prejudice. Mm -hmm. 
But I think um, I, my overseas examples are not are not comparable enough for me to 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 to, to, to make a guess about that. Uh, the the, uh, the what pops into my mind is probably the, in some ways the the the, uh, uh, the least in its in its, in its historical importance of the but, but Northumberland in in, in uh, a very agricultural part of England, where where uh, people uh, uh, where there are a lot of farmers and a lot of herders, and the the city of London, which is where where the government locates, was going to compensate people for what for what was going what was had gone wrong with that, and they had the hardest time trying to explain to the government what had gone wrong, because their idea of a herd of cows of 53, 53 had had been killed. They wanted to give them 53 times the value of the cows, but if you were a herder for your in your sixth or seventh de decade in, in the Northumberland, a herd of 53 cows that all knew each other would, would, had, had many times the value. It isn't just one plus two and then three, but four. But these people knew how, the, these creatures acted together. They, 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 and so I would think it, I think it would be fair to say there that they came. They, they came to have less confidence in the, in the, in the, in the government's bil ability to understand the particular kind of economic circumstances and the cultural circumstances that they were in. And I have run across that before. But I don't think I've ever come across, uh, well, I mean, but if we're going to talk about Yugoslavia, we're talking about quite another thing. You know, I mean, the, the people who lived in Croatia coming to think that there is really no chance at all that a government, that the government, you know, the, the, what, what was once the government of Yugoslavia can be helpful to them. But I don't think, I, th I think probably the, the kind of experience we're talking about here is sharper than anything I've seen in the sense that, that, the, they, that they as a kind of people are no longer able to count on the goodwill, never mind the, the, the kind of the ability to understand of a government. What would you, what would you say to that? I, I, I haven't been, you know, I've been to pretty calm places, outside, outside from Yugoslavia, I've been to pretty calm places, and the American United States is a pretty calm place compared to other countries in the world. So I, I have no comparison with the Middle East, and I have no comparison with, uh, you know, with Africa, so. The related yeah. observation that I might make is that for years, I think still, the <coughs> phrase, you know, is this America, I never thought this would, this would never have happened in Kennebunkport. Yeah. This was sort of levied as a critique that was meant to imply that protections of class or race would, would, have, would protect still. That had victims here been white or wealthy, <coughs> they would not have been so affected. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that in the fullness of reflection, that looks less and less to me like a measured critique of American race and class privilege. Yeah and more and more like a defense mechanism for the people saying it. Yeah. They say, right? This wouldn't have happened in Maine, right? And that in some ways, uh, I think that we, in some ways we misunderstand the extent to which the middle class and white people in Louisiana were terribly affected because we have a desire not to see that those, even those protections, even the protections of race and class are not as strong as we wish they were. And I, th and I think the other side of that coin, which I mean, it, it fits with that, is that I think uh, I wouldn't su wouldn't surprise me that if we went to most countries of Europe or even most countries of, uh, in the rest of the world and said a city in your country was over over was overcome by a ter ter terrible flood, tens of thousands of people without without places to stay, and there are people on the top of, of books. At, of the top, of, you know, on the on the top of buildings, you know, haven't been, haven't had any water or had any. Uh, what would have happened in your government if that had happened? And I would think if you would talk to an awful lot of people from other governments, they would say that could not happen in the Netherlands. That could not happen in France. That could not mm -hmm. happen. And so part part of their part of their critique then would be uh, the the astonishing slowness of the American government to respond to this. And uh, now they do, that doesn't mean that they would know the reasons that, that, that we were that among the things that we've been talking about now. But it really was, and it's a very astonishing moment in American history too from, the, from, from that point of view. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say that was so? I mean, 
I was away. I don't know how many of you were here, but just the look, what I could see on the television screen, I found just unbelievable. And I lived in a world where I had some idea how these, how these, what, these what FEMA was and how it was supposed to work and things like that. being at the Academy Awards with the <laughs> microphone <directly. laughs> uh, Wanted to welcome you back to New Orleans, Kai. It's, it's good to have you back amongst us. Hi. <laughs> uh, bouncing off of Kevin's comment earlier, I was reminded of the late Gore Vidal's <laughs> comment that we live in the United States of amnesia, where no one can remember anything past last Monday. And so in my work, uh, I've been fascinated by the concept of disaster amnesia and the irony, the paradox, if you will, of how uh, we are suffering from risk overload and um, disasters plague. And uh, as things get worse and worse and the risks mount, uh, people take them less and less seriously and project them less and less into their future. And I wonder uh, if we're not seeing some of that uh, yeah. right here in New Orleans uh, with the distinction between, I agree with Kevin, uh, it's a tragedy that we should commemorate, not something necessarily um, to celebrate. But I wonder if you would comment on that notion that in the bigger picture, we are becoming desensitized to the risk overload of our, of our times. I, I, my, my true comment is that's a really interesting idea. <laughs> and I, uh, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I had heard that comment from Vidal, and it, uh, but it, uh, and I, I'm a little embarrassed that it, it hasn't popped into my mind in the last in the last ten years that we've all been talking about uh, talking about this. But I just don't know. It, 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 on, on the one hand, I don't think it's just a question of whether people remember or not, but what they remember. And I, and I, and I, it would be an easy study, you know. So go to Spokane. And ask them what happened and what happened on the streets of New, of New Orleans and uh, uh, in 19, 2005. What they remember of that, what they remember of the time in between, uh, and I think it would partly almost be a contest between the amount that they can imagine they, they could they could have managed to completely forget, and the part where, you know, but but it would be it would be interesting to see how much of it that they forgot. But it would also be interesting what part they do remember and what part they don't. Uh, I the the uh, I think part of what I was talking about here and, the, the, and part of the part of the language the sharp language I well that's not sharp is not the right word but the definitive uh, the language I use it comes from the how many people I've met who don't recall this part of it that don't recall the, that uh, and don't and don't and don't have a memory as to what looked so many for, for the reason for. Imagine, imagine an armed force taking four or five days already armed, already, I mean, this is already, uh, already taking four or five days to en enter one of the capital cities of a state of the, United, of the United States because not only had they been told that there's an insurrection going on, but that they believed it in individually. Imagine that. And uh, I wonder how many people remember it. What, what would you say? I mean, I'd be interested to know what you, you have to say to that. Did they take away that, that <laughs> no, microphone? Oh, no, you got it. He's the spitting image. He talks about we are what we remember. Yeah, yeah. That's what you're alluding to. It's yeah. not what has happened, but what we think has happened. Yeah. And what we're uncomfortable enough with to reframe in a diversionary fashion or forget altogether. Yeah. And that's what I see happening in the risk society. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, well thought. We may have time for maybe two more questions, and I see two hands there in the back in the front. I wanted to address the word culpability that floated through the room and used it, but I wanted to direct it towards the long disquisition uh, on the immediate coverage of the event and the distortions of that coverage. And some news organizations were named, but these are, to some extent, individuals. And there's also the 
people making statements statements within the government, the police commissioner, the mayor. Yeah. And I wanted to ask sort of two sides of the same coin, a general question as to why, what was the motive for this sensationalism and this distortion on the part of the media, and I don't mean a sort of sensational cable news media, you were talking about the Financial Times and the New York Times. And then the second side of that coin is, what is the motivation on the part of, say, the mayor or the police commissioner to feed into that, such, as you just said, such you create an environment where a standing army would be bracing themselves to even enter a city? Uh, well, I'd say, number one, that, that uh, looking, um, looking back on what was happening, the odds were extremely high that most of the people who were gi giving oral reports over the broadcast of what was happening in New Orleans were in New Orleans, but only in a sense. And very few of them were invited to or had the stomach to go into the Lower Ninth, and the, very few of them vis visited any of the places they were talking about. So most of what they reported back to us were things that they had heard from people who they thought were going out there. And uh, now that's what, maybe that's, maybe that's the defense that many of them would have, but Anderson Cooper, who's a wonderful man, I'm sure, and all of that, but he, you know, he just, he wasn't, he, he was in, he had to be near microphones, he had to be ready, you know, you're there and, this, and the, the news comes to you from some other place. And that's where the chief of police came in, and that's where a lot of, I mean, the, the chief of police wasn't the only one who was saying things like that. Uh, but I think a lot of them, a lot of a lot of those reports, you know, and I and, and I have to, and it also should be added to this: the, the people who recognized that the reports were wrong, were the same organizations that sent them out in the first place. So that it was David Carr in the New York Times who was re rethinking what had happened in his own universe, you know, and it's, that was true on CNN. And it was true in other places too. But so I mean, it, it almost has two questions, you know. Uh, why it, it's, it's easier for me to understand why a reporter would accept the notion that babies were being raped, which if you pause about it for a moment, is not something. Have you ever heard that that as a, as a accused anybody of that before? It, it's, 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 it comes out of a it just comes out of a different space, and uh, I'm, I'm not even arguing whether it's true or not. I'm just saying to, to you know to, to, for it to enter the, the, realm, the realm of possibility. That, 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 is, that, that, you, that you have. Um, so I guess the real the, one question is why would not reporters at this point in time know better than to assume that people who just come back from a tragic, from a tragic scene are the best people to learn what was actually happening? And then I think the other question is uh, why, why did Eddie Compass believe that? I don't doubt for a second. I doubt for, I, I don't think that it was a political motive. I don't know whether it, I, I, Lord knows where those words came from, you know, and I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make a guess that he himself thought that's exactly what happening. But I do think one of the things that happens is, uh, and this is, this is a little, this is a little slimy here, but I, but that what, what, what happens in the imagination of people, they come across the first, the hard, there's something they can, it's so, so difficult that they can hardly imagine it. It's beyond, beyond is describing, but words require you to describe it. So that what, I, I, think, it, I think it's very, I, I have no evidence for this, but that people who will, what I just saw or heard under cover of darkness, what I just saw or heard is the hardest, the, the worst thing that could ever happen to human beings. Well, what's the worst thing that can happen to human beings? The mind makes that translation into words because that's what language is in part. And now that's too simple. But it does mean, that, but, it, it, but Eddie Compass must have felt that something really horrendous was going on out there. And they were not visible to his eyes as he was, as he'd be, he was the first to say afterwards, you know. He was getting his reports and they were getting his reports. And there is something about the tension of the moment and there is something about that, that, uh, where, where the mind can absorb and for a while agree with something which later looks irresponsible and, and, and not you know, I can't even come with the right word to finish that. All right, last question. I've got a really simple um, question for you. 
I said what I asked anyway. But first, I to I'm in trouble now. <laughs> how much, um, how important your work has been and to me. I know many of us who've been trying to make sense out of Katrina. You had a lot of insights from your, your previous work about um, how disasters unfold. And one of the best lessons for me that, that you've made over and over again is that those people who have, who are least well prepared, that have the least amount of resources to, to, to go through one of these things, yeah. end up getting hit the hardest. And yeah. so yeah. often after the fact, when you see poor people living in low-lying areas struggling you know, to, to, to move forward, I, I always try to remind people that of, of, of that really important point that you made, that you have to kind of look at where they were beforehand, because right. they, yeah. you know, they, they, they didn't have very much to begin with, and they're le least uh, likely to absorb the blow. Yeah. My question for you is that, I've noticed, and I'm sure that you have too, is that within those groups, within the, the, the people who have the least amount of resources to, to, to weather that storm, um, there's a lot of variance about you know yes. who moves on, and who doesn't. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about what distinguishes um, the, the, those, the, those people who had little to begin with and, and were hit the hardest, what distinguishes those who, who seem to be able to move forward from those who, who struggle to do so? Uh, I'm, I'm going to sneak out of this one by saying that, that uh, if you put together on a, t on a table all the sociological evidence ever put together from disasters, there wouldn't be much of a record there for the question that you're asking. Because it is, I think, it, 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 this really does, we're now we're really talking about what kind of family produces children that are there, that I'm going I'm gonna, to gonna use it once, this, only once, <laughs> are, that are, look like they're more resilient when the time comes. You know, what kind of schools are, do this, what kind of, what kind of of internal equipment are they born with, things like that. And I would call that much more of a, of a, of a, of a psychological <coughs> question than a sociological one. But, which is also another way of saying that there is no simple answer to that one. Because if it was one that, that it was registered in the, in the data and registered in the, in, the, you know, in the statistics, that we would know much more than we do, we do about that now. It's a hidden thing. But I also, I'm, I will add one thing. I mean, this is now, this is not necessarily a good ending point. But the, uh, on the subject of this, I'll, I'll, I'll call it resilience again, but, but I really don't use that word very much, is that I think one of the things that happened in the evacuation, or, or I'm, I'm going to talk about refugees, because that's, I learned the word refugee to be used from the people who, 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 who uh, officials said should never have been used. <laughs> The, but the, the, the uh, because refugees are people that are being exiled from a place that they that they am, you know am, and refugees uh, rarely get a chance to c get a chance to come back, but that I think it is fair to say on, on the strength of a, a relatively small that there are a number of of, of African American families that had <coughs> almost an advantage in dealing with what ha with with evacuation in the sense that that the the nuclear family may be the best way to get along in a capitalist society, but it's not necessarily the best way to get along in a time of crisis, where you have a much, where you have a wide, much more extended family to deal with. You've got, you've got a range of people who have an immediate sense of, and they live within the range of each other. So that the evacuation pattern for, for, for quite a number of the people, it's, it's only an idea for me because there's no, there's no real data. But you know, a, a family of 15 uh, evacuating as a group it's much more likely to happen in New Orleans than it would be in, in New York, where a family of 15 would be spread out all over the, over the universe. So I don't know whether that's true or not. And I know I'm moving. I, I could tell while a sentence was going on that I was moving away from the question that you <laughs> asked. But sentences are like that sometimes. <laughs> uh, we are over our time. And I, I think the single most obnoxious way that I could end would be by reading some of my own work. But I'm, I'm going to do that anyway. Uh, but don't I get to look at it first? No, I don't. No, no, you read. You had a chance already. Oh, you, oh, yeah, oh you I see. Okay, yeah, you passed. Okay, this is from my dissertation. It comes oh, from, oh, 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 okay. It, it comes from the acknowledgement section. I, I just you. wanted to share what oh, I wrote about oh, you. Oh, 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 yes. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's very important. <laughs> yeah, this is why you passed it. Yeah. I wrote then and would like to reiterate that if I had gotten nothing else out of Yale's PhD program, other than the chance to meet you and have lunch with you from time to time at Clark's, it would have been worth it. 
And that is not only because your work on disaster inspired my own, but uh, because you helped me to see that the purpose of studying the humanities is to learn the practical art of being humane. So thank you. And let's thank Kai for being here.